So, we're walking into the Foundling Museum, into the portico. What a grand portico it is as well. What a grand portico it is. And there's a beautiful cast iron design with the, the Foundling Hospital's logo on it. And I do believe that Hogarth designed that logo. Well, that's got to be the perfect introduction to the Foundling Museum. So, shall we go in? Let's go. I'm Lem Sisse. And I'm Asif Khan. And this is... Meet, Meet me, me at, at the, the museum! museum. <laughs> Let's go now. My name is Lem Sisse. I'm Chancellor of the University of Manchester. I'm a poet and I'm a writer and creative. And this is my favourite museum, started by Thomas Coram. I'm bringing my friend Asif Khan. Hello, Asif. Hello, Lem. This is the first, a lot of people don't know this, the first public art gallery in the United Kingdom. I was brought up in care. There is a care story inside this building. Not only is this the first public art gallery, but this is also in many ways the first children's home. It started off as a hospital uh, for the poor and the destitute, offering care and education. But through art, it has become so much more. Hi, we've got our art pass for the museum. Oh, brilliant. So, art pass gets you free admission to the museum. I'll just print you off a ticket. Thank you. In the reception area of the Foundling Museum, there's a glass case, the shape of a sort of grandfather clock. That's right. Yeah. But there's no clock inside of it. There's a glass case on the outside, clear as day. And on the inside, what have we got here, Asif? You've got two musicians, a boy and a girl, family portraits behind them on a the wall, dog at their feet. They look like puppets, don't they? Yeah, marionettes. In, in yeah. Marionettes. Yeah. Insert 20p to hear us play. That was a lot less impressive than I thought it was going to be. But the last word did was hallelujah, and I think that was oh, a handle that what he reference. Said? Yeah. Oh, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Maybe that's handle, I don't know. Yeah, I that's think it true. probably is. Yeah. But then we have this Luther Holden, honorary surgeon, founded in hospital in 1864, subsequently a governor. He looks like a governor, doesn't he? I love his chops, his, his facial hair. You know. They've come back, he's now a hipster. He'd be running a barista, wouldn't he? <laughs> A coffee place in Hackney. Yeah. In 2007, I walked past the museum on my way to another meeting and they had Lewis Hamilton doing go-karting on the green outside. And this whole area has lots of memories for me when I used to work in London, I used to work on Bloomsbury Square. If I'd have known the, the quality of the museum that was here, I'd have, I'd have popped in on a lunchtime and had a look around. And I think it's important for people to actually recognise what's on their doorstep and take advantage of it. It's, it's a hidden gem. It's only been a museum since 2004. Uh -huh. So it's still forming a kind of conversation with the world, really. My first ever job in Bristol, I was a, I was a tourist officer and we were based in a church called St Nicholas Church. And in the church, they had a giant triptych painted by Hogarth. So every day for a year, I would see a Hogarth work, and it was, it was almost like priceless masterpiece. So I'm really interested to learn more about Hogarth's involvement with yeah. the museum. And Hogarth and Frederick Handel were the two creatives who supported Coram when he set up the Foundling Hospital for the Poor and Destitute uh, of London. So the idea that creatives could make social change is uh, an interesting one, and one that I'm particularly interested it's in. It kind of parallels with, with the work that you do around um, identifying issues around people who grew up in care or um, people who have been adopted. And as an artist yourself, you could possibly relate well to the, the intent and, and kind of philanthropy of people like Hogarth and Handel. I can, but I, I really want other people to realise, or to see at least, you know, I mean, Superman was a was a foundling. Uh -huh. Harry Potter was a foundling. Yeah. He really was. Uh -huh. um, Moses was adopted uh -huh. in real life. Moses was adopted, and and this the foundling hospital is where, you know, the real foundlings were. Yeah. 
uh, rather than the fictional. I was watching the adaptation of Les Miserables at the weekend and, you know, you look at a character like Cosette, you know, left by her mother in the care of someone else and then the, the issues that came from that. And I found it such a difficult watch. I know it's fiction, but sometimes the best fiction and the best art can tell that story kind of deeper philosophical level as well. Well, if we go through popular culture and through classic culture, we'll find that there are foundlings actually right at the heart of it. For example, Elf, contemporary reference. <laughs> 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 yeah. Elf, but they're right, Oliver Twist, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And Dickens was just round the corner here. Yeah. Uh, but the Foundling Museum kind of brings all of these stories together, and there is actually a painting that was inspired by one of Dickens' stories in here. I think one of the best museums and the best galleries do is they present a story and it's for you to then question that narrative and see what context it's presented in but also whose voice has been presented if you look at foundlings and people who grew up in care quite often they're the voiceless um so who's actually given um the people who were in the foundling hospital their voice that's what i'm looking forward to seeing and hearing So look, here on the wall is a list of the names, some of the names that the young people were called. Every child, when accepted into the hospital, what does it say? It says, every child, when accepted into the hospital, was given a new name, in part to protect the anonymity of the parent. The names on this wall represent some of the first 3,000 children accepted in the 18th century. So we have a, a William Strongbow, a Sarah Rainbow, um, Charity Smith, uh, Christopher Wren, that's clearly a reference. Um, Alexander Pope. Francis Bacon. This is an unusual name. Boscawin Hollywell. I haven't come across that name, Boscawin, before. Uh, it's Boscawin Hollywell. Isaac Bliss. Jane Hogarth. Inigo Scotland. Look, why do we think that the anonymity of the parents was important? I mean, what, what is that? About is that because having your child in here was supposed to be a shameful thing, or was thought of as a shameful thing? Francis Drake, even there's another name. Francis Drake. It seems quite cold to me. It really does. Yeah, but it's quite often if you go out, if you go out to life with with some of these names, it's almost like the conversation that oh, the child would have as an adult. So actually, having some of these names leads to being identified as somebody who was in a foundling yeah. hospital. Yeah. I'd imagine I mean, being called over Cromwell or Geoffrey Chaucer or... But it sounds like modern branding to me. This changing of names is very emotive to me, as somebody who had my own name changed. You were changed to Norman, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, th I thought my name was Norman when I grew up, and that was actually the name of the social worker who gave me to the foster parents. So how do you feel when you hear the name Norman in, kind of, in the public realm when you're out and about I'm all right with it. I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm fine. I'm the same person. People say, oh, you changed to Lemsis A. I'm like, no, my, my name was always Lemsis A. So this thing, this thing about naming somebody after somebody else who's been fostered or adopted is a really tricky uh, one. Do you sever a child's story and say, no, it started off with this new name? Or do you acknowledge the name that the mother gave to the child as the child is then adopted. It's a really, hey man, it happened in slavery days. Hiya, Carol. Hello, hello, it's so lovely to see you. It's always good to see you. Welcome, welcome. This is Asif Khan, my friend. Lovely nice to meet you, Asif, thank you for yes. coming. My name is Carol Howell, I'm the director of the Foundling Museum. Tell us you. about how this started. The Family Museum's been open since 2004, but it has been on this site, the art on the walls has been on this site for nearly 300 years. Um, we tell the story of the Foundling Hospital, which was simultaneously the UK's first children's charity and also the UK's first public art gallery. And it was founded in 1739 to take in babies that would otherwise be abandoned on London streets. And two of its founding governors and catalysts for its success were the artist William Hogarth and the composer George Friedrich Handel. And is there something unique about the fact that uh, two great artists, Hogarth and Handel, supported Corum to finance um, their foundling hospital? 
Yeah, I mean, there were foundling hospitals across Europe um, from about the 13th century onwards. Basically, wherever you got the Catholic Church, you would have foundling hospitals. But of course, London, England in the 18th century is Protestant. What's amazing, you will have other founding hospitals will have works of art, which was artists giving their work explicitly, autonomously, as a way of raising the charity's profile, encouraging wealthy, educated, the wealthy classes to come. Because in London in the mid-18th century, there was nowhere to see contemporary British art. So Hogarth knew that by donating not only his art, but all of the other leading artists of the day, this was a win-win. This would make people, give people a reason to come visit. And once they were there, they could see the children singing in the choir, having their lessons, eating their meals. Their heartstrings would be plucked and they would give money. But at the same time, these same individuals who ordinarily would be buying only French and Italian art because they were all going on the grand tour, that they would be seeing the very best that British artists could do and so would be likely to commission Reynolds or Hudson rather than Casali or Soldi. So for Hogarth, it was a win-win. Support a charity that he believed in passionately and also raise the opportunities professionally for him and his fellow artists. So why don't we go upstairs and find a quieter place? Yes, we can head up the staircase that came from the boys' wing of the founding hospital. So these steps, thousands of founding boys would have gone up and down them from the 1740s to the 1950s. Did they slide down the balusters, do you think? Do you know what? They did. So the boys' staircase had spikes put on it because the boys used to slide down the staircase until one boy slid, fell and died. So they put spikes on the boys' staircase, not on the girls' staircase, because the girls were far better behaved. Um, And apparently it was one of the few things that would uh, be rewarded with corporal punishment. And there was a notice on the stairs that made it clear to the boys that any boy caught trying to slide down the banisters would be beaten. Right, so uh, (laughs) note to self. (laughs) We did do that in my first children's home, Woodfields. We uh, slid down the banisters and... uh, just writing about that in my autobiography at the moment, literally oh, at the moment. Yeah. Well, it's so what a great story to hear you say. <laughs> <laughs> How would the Foundlings themselves engage with, say, musicians and actors? Was there any kind of interchange with them? Um, the, the standard of musicianship at the hospital was incredibly high, and the boys and girls um, all sang in the choir. And interestingly, particularly the blind Foundlings were trained often to be semi-professional m- musicians. So the children would be in the chapel. There was a Between the boys and the girls' wing, there was a chapel um, that people would come to attend, particularly Sunday service. So people like Dickens, would have a subscription for a pew so they could guarantee themselves a a seat Um, and because the standard of musicianship was so high um, and so the children themselves would therefore also be part of that that they would not only be singing but they would be hearing the organ playing they would be hearing the concerts that were given Handel gave annual benefit concerts of the Messiah in the chapel every year which was a huge fundraiser for the hospital And the art itself was hung around the hospital. So we have illustrations from the 18th century of the children's dining room. And you can see some of the great paintings hanging on the walls. So So they were around the art. So they were around. It wasn't just kept away from them for the public. No, no, no. Wow. And um, we have a lovely... uh, There's a lot of trust in that. Yes. expensive stuff. Yes. And I think also, I mean, there's a lovely uh, sculpture downstairs, a marble sculpture of a shepherd boy who's looking... He's looking decidedly cheeky, and when you come round the back, he's got a slingshot in his hand, hidden behind his back. And again, you talk to the former pupils, and they love that sculpture. And there was something about the cheekiness of the boy that they, when they were growing up in the founding hospital school, they all talk about kind of feeling an affinity for him. So, yes, the children, the art was around them, the music was around them, and I think, I mean, you know, we have to acknowledge that... There was very little individuality and obviously no, no love, it, as we understand it, and we know how important that is for children growing up. But without a shadow of doubt, they had the absolute best care in terms of food, medical attention, accommodation, education. So an awful lot of care was put into assuring that the children who came through the founding hospital, that their life chances were enormously improved. 
I think the responsibility of the artist to serve society is at the heart of what the Foundling Museum is about. And the contemporary artists like Grace and Perry, uh, the writers like Jacqueline Wilson, artists like Cornelia Parker, have all uh, exhibited here. So you get a sense of the contemporary as well as the artists who were contemporary at the time, that is Hogarth and Handel, etc., So Handel and Hogarth will have been aware that having the art and interacting with the music will have had an effect on the emotional well-being of the children. I'm sure, yeah. And I think, I mean, one of the things, I mean, Hogarth was an incredibly involved governor. I mean, he not only donated art, he created the coat of arms, he created the uh, illustrations for the legal documentations. He and his wife fostered some of the founding children, and he was an inspector of the wet nurses in the borough of Chiswick, where he lived, so keeping an eye for the babies for the first five years were looked after by wet nurses, so he was keeping an eye on them there. And I think it's worth remembering that Hogarth spent five years of his childhood in the Fleet Prison because his father was declared bankrupt, and in the 18th century the whole family goes into debtors' prison. So Hogarth was an artist who knew from personal experience that bad things happen to good people, that families can very quickly fall through the cracks, that there aren't systems in place to catch them and help them. So I think he had, he had skin in the game, I think, in terms of knowing what life was like for these children and how fate and chance plays a huge role in how people's lives turn out. And, and even though Hogarth was childless, as was Coram, as was Handel, it is a great story of empathy, of people imagining, isn't it, walking a, walking a mile in somebody else's shoes and getting a sense of what that is like and not being cowed by the scale of the problem, but knowing that every one of us has, has a responsibility to try and make a difference. And it doesn't matter whether you're a painter or a sculptor or you know, a wealthy businessman or a composer. All of us have something that we can contribute to improve the lives, particularly in this case, of very vulnerable young people. Asif, as a director of the Scottish Poetry Library, does this have echoes for you? Yeah, our mission is to, to bring people and poetry together, but the broader aim is also to look at helping build people's resilience through art. Yes. And you were talking about things that artists can bring and what you can learn from artists, and the tremendous thing is around resilience, you know. Quite often, the recovery from the knocks you get through life artists, you know, they have to live with that. Yes. And I can imagine the stories that Hogarth and Handel possibly had to share with the kids was to say, yeah. you know, through these characteristics and strengths that, you know, you can get through life. Poets in particular, I see that quite often, is that the stories they share amongst themselves are around, we're in this because we love it, you know. We're almost like permitted to have a different worldview and share it with people. But I wanted to, have you seen the poem that's on display at the moment downstairs? No, oh, but no. I must show it. We should, must we, go, go, should see. we go down? We should go see, yes. Thanks, Carol. This is a, well, I'll show you when we get to This is a poem written by a mother leaving her baby. Right. And I will try very hard not to choke up because this is something that gets me every time. Hard is my lot in deep distress to have no help where most should find Sure nature meant her sacred laws should men as strong as women bind. Regardless he, unable I, to keep his image of my heart. Tis vile to murder, hard to starve, and death almost for me to part. If fortune should her favours give, that I in better plight may live, I'll try to have my boy again, and train him up the best of men. And then she ends, she signs off, and she says, Va mon enfant, prends la fortune. Go, my child find your fortune. All the clocks that come from the Foundling Hospital that still work, that chimed for the children and chimed for us. It's a very moving place, this. Yeah. It's a very joyous place. It's a very moving place. I think one of our fellows, the artist Richard Wentworth, he put it really well. He said, this is not a museum about children, it's a museum about childhood. And of course, childhood is something that every single one of us shares. 
It's a lesson for artists, this as well. I mean, that's what I take away from it, that artists can be involved in uh, changing society for the better and that that's part of our responsibility. You know what I mean? That it's not an add-on. You know, when you do those workshops in the schools and those workshops in the community centres, they're not just an extra revenue stream. You know, there's a really central reason to do those, to do that work, that should be right at the heart of, of what it is to be a poet or a painter or a, a sculptor. Yes. Yeah, so when in museums and libraries do the the, the Lenin outreach programmes, there's a direct narrative arc to what was going on here at the Foundling Hospital way back in the early 18th century. So Asif, we've got um, headphones, um, which seem to be in a lot of museums these days, and this is Sidney Ansell, 1923, he was born. Uh, Sidney attended the Foundling Museum School in Redhill and then went on to Berkhamsted uh, when it moved in 1935. So this is Sydney describing how he received a basic education and was reasonably well prepared for army life. Sydney entered a military band when he left school and had a successful army career, retiring as a major. That's good. Let's have a listen. In Red Hill, the lady teachers in Red Hill for the girls' side used to have to come over to the boys' side because their hostel was on the boys' side. So uh, I happened to be standing in the corridor waiting to go in to, to see the headmaster for another tapping off, I presume, and this lady teacher came along the corridor in her high heel well, and her shoes that were clanking, clunk, 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 and I was said, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, as one of the female teachers was walking across the uh, hallway. You got corporal punishment. He went into the army, the... became a major. Did you ever get the belt at school? Uh, I did, actually, yeah. It stopped, I think, in our second year, the cane. What did you get it for? I think it was the cane. Uh, I can't remember. To be honest, I can't remember a lot of my childhood because of being in care. I genuinely cannot, mm-hmm. which is why somebody like Sydney, sort of telling his story has great value. This whole place is about voices and the reclaiming of memory, really. It was an existence, really, that we were, we were devoid of any knowledge of what the outside world was like. We had no different experiences of each other, so we had no real conversation. You couldn't say, yeah, I did this or I did that, what did you do? We were, all, we were all doing exactly the same things day in and day out, all dressed the same, uh, all getting up at the same time, all going to bed at the same time. Nothing to really uh, fire the imagination for, for conversation or for, for, for whatever. We're now going to go down to the collection of tokens and meet the collection's manager, Alison Duke. This collection is the heart of this museum. These tokens were left by the women who brought their children here to be outsourced, really. The tokens were a way of the women identifying their baby. So they were leaving one thing for their child. Um, There's more things down there from the 1700s. There's the names that they gave the children. So the mothers gave them one name, but when they were fostered or adopted, they were given another name. Shall we go? Um, Alison Duke, I'm the collections manager here at the museum. So um, we've just come into the introductory gallery and the first thing you see here is an image of William Hogarth's Gin Lane and it's his famous print where he looks at the damage that the gin craze has done to London and we have these extraordinary kind of scenes of people fighting, a man stealing a bone from a dog, um, a woman who appears to have smallpox losing her baby because she's so kind of caught up in the kind of drug addiction that's there. And alongside that, we have statistics showing how London has grown from the beginning of the kind of 18th century, where it's about kind of half a million people, 
through to the kind of end of that century where we're at almost a million. And this is the kind of environment that, you know, the founding hospital was set in of this kind of big influx of people coming into an urban environment and also coming away from their support network. So, you know, there will be young women coming into London to look for work where they've left their family behind. So if they get into trouble, they don't have anybody to help them. 75% of children born in London died before they were five years old. That was a result of the poverty and the lack of support. In part, I mean, it's also partly just to do with the infant mortality, which is much higher at that stage. I mean, we are looking at, you know, the time before good antibiotic so it's well before penicillin it's just a shock and when you look at the workhouse statistics it's actually even worse it's nine out of ten children dying before the age of one and on that cheery note <laughs> shall we carry on <laughs> yes so the foundling hospital was set up by a man called thomas Corum, who felt that not only the kind of children being abandoned on the streets of london was a real tragedy in terms of the children's life, but it was also a waste of a resource. And so he set up the Founding Hospital as an institution to look after those children and to give them kind of training and a trade so they could support themselves and become useful citizens. So the child comes into the hospital, has their name changed, and to identify the child to the mother, instead of a name she had to bring a token because the child was known by a different name. That's correct. And so the tokens that exist for these children, um, there are an awful lot of them which are actually just scraps of fabric which have been cut from a child's clothing. And the mother would be given one piece of the clothing and the child would be given the other piece. Sometimes they're just a very simple kind of thing saying that the child hasn't been christened and that the mother would like the child to be given a certain name. Some of them are much more complicated and they might actually be a piece of poetry, kind of expressing the mother's, you know, sorrow at having to give up her child and her desire to come back for the child. This is a really crucial point in the whole story that's worth looking at. The mothers may be coming back for their children. Mm. A lot of people think of foundling. As soon as they hear the word foundling, they think, oh, the, the child was left by somebody. But actually, in their origin story, many of those mothers wanted to come back for the Very for much, the you know. These are not abandoned children. These are children whose mother, parent, had to make a really difficult decision. And I think that's a really important thing to remember, that, you know, it's not an easy decision for anybody to have made. Now, you said there was an admissions process. Was mm. it, what would lead someone not to be admitted into the Foundling Hospital? Um, at the very beginning, it was sheer numbers, so there were always more children than they could accept. So the first day that children were admitted, there were only 30 children admitted. And it's actually recorded that it was hard to tell which mothers were more upset, those who had to leave their child and those who had to take the child away. Oh, I see, yes, wow. The same trauma for the mother who has to take their child away because they can't have their child looked after and the woman who has to leave her child. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's the most heroic thing for a human being to do to leave your child to a better life. These are what we call the tangible tokens, and these are hard objects. There is a lot of coins, medals, etc. in the collection. But there are also other objects that represent kind of what was happening in Georgian life at the time. And so they're very kind of simple objects. So there's a hairpin, a thimble that's been squashed, a little pot of rouge, which is this one here, where the lid's been broken off and you can actually see rouge remaining. So 18th century makeup in front of us here. We often think about 
the foundlings are starting at year zero. You know, they arrive and that link with their past has been broken. But then they go on and they create families of their own. And so for me, these objects don't just represent the past, they represent the future as well. So if a, if a foundling grew up in to adulthood, would they be permitted to take the token with them or did they remain with the no. hospital? No, so the tokens remained within the records, which is why we still have them today. So they never knew what object their parent left with them and some of them actually have the parents' names on them so that might have been a way that they would have been able to identify the parent and the governors of the hospital promise the mother's anonymity so that they wouldn't be identified in the future by their child. It has a, an echo in how children are treated today. Names are still changed in children and this question as to whether an adopted child should have a relationship with their birth parents is a very live one. Often the birth parent now will be able to contact the adopting parents. I wonder how many of these children found their way back to their parents. Possibly they did, because there wasn't a lot of travel then, you know, especially for that class. But can, you, can you also imagine if some of the records, as she was saying, it was quite difficult to, to marry the object up with the child. And I wonder, I mean, just the tragedy of that situation. Yeah, that's horrific for a parent to come back to the Foundling Hospital and and for the token and the bill to have been separated. Oh, God, that must be difficult. This isn't an easy museum to come to. You know, people regularly cry in our galleries. And so I think it's important to find a way for our younger visitors to access that without avoiding asking those difficult questions. And for a lot of children, you know, the idea of not kind of seeing their parents again is one they can't imagine. But however, there are so many children today who actually have that very experience and have lost their parents. So we're coming to the end of our visit now. I mean, what did you like? I, th- I think it was, there was two things that stood out to me. One was the, the emotions that you can get from understanding an object story, particularly around the tokens. I mean, I was really deeply moved. And also by the poem that was read yeah. about the mother, you know, as she had to abandon her child. And th- that was the one side around the kind of emotional aspect of items and objects in a museum, but also the inspiration you get from artists and what artists can do to support the mission of an institution through the generosity and through their kind of worldviews. Yeah, and for me, uh, definitely the poem. And I think those um, tokens are just so emotional. There's so much um, in that little tiny object. There's so much invested in it. I was also impressed by not only the knowledge and understanding of the, the staff here, but the sheer passion that they presented. You know, they care about museums, they care about sharing the stories of the museum. And I guess that is a gift that museums can share to the world. What's good about visiting museums and other places of heritage is that it, it can take you away from your moment in time and what your concerns are at that moment in time and takes you to another world. You, you hear other stories, learn about other people's issues and and you suddenly realise you're, you're connected through the history and through the heritage to where we are now with society, but also with the ideas, the movements and the networks, particularly around the, the kind of roles and responsibility of artists, where we are today. I, I agree that these are time machines. Museums are time machines. They take us into the past and show how it is relative to who and what we are right now. We don't need Doctor Who. You know what I mean? We've got it all here. We've got it in a a Hogarth painting. Thanks for listening to Meet Me at the Museum. Please like and subscribe to the podcast. I've been Lem Sisse. Thanks for listening to me and Asif Khan at the Foundling Museum here in London. Don't forget, if you've got an art pass, you can get free entry or discounts on museums all around the country. Bye for now.